Good morning, everyone. My name is Madeline Perez. I'm a first year student here at MIT Sloan, and I have the distinct privilege to welcome you to today's panel, a one on one with Nate Silver. Our speakers are statistician, best selling author of The Signal and the Noise, and founder of 538.com, Nate Silver, and Dara Mori, who is a co founder, co chair of the Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, general manager of the Houston Rockets, and a very happy uh, person after last night's win over the Celtics. Yes, I agree. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, just letting you guys know for the first time, we've been collecting questions for this panel over the last week, um, but we are still hoping to gain more today. So use our hashtag AskNate and SSAC16, which are right there on either screen. And without further ado, here's Daryl. Thanks. <clears throat> this is a this is pretty exciting for me. I'm not a speaker. I'm a facilitator this morning. <laughs> I feel like we needed, like, pump-up music. I'm going to have to get, we needed, like, Rocky music coming in here. Um, so, yeah, we've collected these questions. We're also going to take live questions, as she said. Um, this is the first time we've done this. It's sort of like a Reddit, a Reddit Q&A. Anyone who's done those, these can get a little can get messy at times, but uh, <laughs> we've taken the best upvoted questions, so we'll, we'll see what we got. All right, we're going to, I'm going to, we've gotten a lot of sports and a lot of politics questions. Uh, we're going to say, we're going to talk a little more about the sport of politics, a little more interesting, relevant right now. So um, I'll start with, uh, this is a question for you, Nate. Thank you, uh, Daryl. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there anything fundamentally shifting in the presidential election primaries that is making past data less predictive? Uh, if yes, how are you adjusting? And what the heck went on in Michigan? So we should tell Michigan, Michigan is easy yeah. to explain. Oh, which is, really? Well, let's, first of all. Why didn't you explain it before then? <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes the underdogs <laughs> win. We had you guys as a 28% oh. chance last night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We had a, Let's just say we both had a tough, <laughs> a tough forecasting year at times. So, yeah. um, Michigan, I think, is kind of still on the Cartesian plane, where um, you know we gave Sanders a one percent shot because it's a real simple polling-based model, and um, there's never been a twenty-one point miss in a poll before, where Kennedy was losing by twenty-one points and won. So, I don't know. Um, you know, it's not like we were standing up and yelling, oh, this can't happen. In fact, we kind of said in the chat beforehand, I'm a little worried about this one, right? But a model is a, is a tool, and that's a simple model, and simple models are, are easy to explain when they go wrong, right? You can debate, maybe you should make the margin of error a little wider, but, you know, would people really be like, oh, these guys got it right if we had Bernie with a 2% chance instead of a 1% chance? You know, I think probably not. Um, However, Was that like Golden State, Philly, basically? Though, like Golden State. Just... Well, we had Golden State and the Lakers, and Golden State with a with a five percent chance of losing to the Lakers, and they did. Right. right. I don't know if they were hungover or what, but <laughs> um, maybe that happened. But the thing uh... about so there is one thing about sports, right? Which is that in sports, we can go back and say, um, oh, let's go back and look in this database. We have a database of every NBA game and ABA game ever, um, and we have a projection, a prediction for every game, and it turns out that. You know, they're actually 30 upsets bigger than Golden State versus mm -hmm. L.A. Because it was a game in L.A. and we count for travel and stuff like that. Um, but you can say, this thing had a 5% chance of happening. And by the way, uh, we can prove this because out of 1,000 similar examples, this happened 50 times. Um, in politics, you have a smaller sample size. But, um, but for kind of state-by-state -state stuff, it's not too bad. I mean, you know, we have... There are about 200 well-polled primaries in our database, and you have this example in Michigan, and one in 84 in New Hampshire with Gary Hart was, um, I think, 17 points down and one. Um, so, you know, that part is, again, kind of more linear. The Trump thing, though, is more challenging. Mm -hmm. um, and I was trying to think earlier, is there any kind of analogy to Trump in sports prediction, and I'm not really sure there is. It'd be like um, it'd be like a rules change that made a profound bit of difference, but you didn't know the rules change until you started playing the game, and you had to kind of infer what the new rules were. Um, 
<laughs> so you don't have to deal with those types of problems in sports, I don't think, very often. Gambling so it's like the play. game's over and we're counting all the threes as fours. And you know, there's a new winner at, after the game. Yeah, something. you like, don't know the score. That's the other right. thing, too, <laughs> right? Um, it's like actually Boston won last night, yeah. right? They have more five and a half pointers. Well, that sucks, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you're also dealing with the whole nomination process, then instead of state by state, then you get into a very small sample size too. So it can suffice to say that, oh, in the roughly 12 or 13 competitive primaries since 1972, and that cut us, because that's when people started voting, before then it was really smoke-filled rooms, um, there's not really been a phenomenon like Trump before. But zero out of 12 is way different than zero out of 120, which is way different than zero out of 12,000. And so, um, you know, to some extent, estimating the tail probability is, is tricky. At the same time, if you're gonna claim something's a black swan, it at least had better be pretty fucking weird. And this is pretty weird. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, this is not like some, this is not like, if we had had the Houston Rockets as a 2% favorite or underdog last night, right? Or a 0.2%, and that would be bad modeling, I guess. You know, mm. with this Trump, it's like, I don't know. I mean, something, I guess one thing you can say is that if you were initially as we were, many people were, but we were definitely among these people who were skeptical of Trump's chances of winning the nomination, in part because we thought it would be so consequential um, for the Republican Party and maybe for the country, and usually, high impact events occur less frequently. Now that it appears as though it might occur, we do get to say, oh, this is gonna be pretty bad for, for the GOP. You've stolen a later question, but I'll, I'll more for the, um, is there any, so you're struggling with the Trump thing, I can, I can tell, just by hearing you talk. <laughs> um, and the, that's coming out in a question, is there a historic moment that was similar where everyone was like, what the heck is going on in, in politics? Yeah, I mean, this is part of the problem, too, is that, you know, to draw analogies to Trump, you have to go back, I think, um, you know, before recent elections, before I was born in 1978, before my time, probably to the, the 60s or to the, um, to the 30s or the progressive era, 1890s, where you had periods of social upheaval. Um, you know, there are reference points for it. And very often when there are big political realignments in the United States, big turning points, they're ugly. Very often they turn on questions of race and they're very nasty and they can be violent. Um, and so, you know, yeah, there are kind of rhymes in this Trump thing with, with more distant parts of American history. And in some ways it is analogous to, um, I think, you know, before the 2007, 2008 economic crash, there were some economists who said, we have the economy tamed. You can have like a mild recession, but mm. you couldn't have a full-blown crisis. We understand the economy too well now. And I think in some ways Trump is, is similar. So in a lot of ways, economically and politically, the period from, um, from about <clears throat> 1972 to 2007 or thereabouts was a very calm and happy period for the United States, which is not to say there wasn't a lot of turmoil, but a relatively stable period, really going back to, if you go back to um, really post-World War II um, until September 11th or so, and may have been kind of an outlier. We kind of assume that when nothing terrible happens, that that's normal, but lots of elections are, are crazy. Um, American history is crazy, crazy in different ways every election, but we may have been spoiled by um, what we thought was kind of this long boom, I guess it's called in economics, this long kind of peace um, that uh, you need a lot of luck to sustain. Um, <clears throat> sticking with Trump, sorry, sorry, we're, we're helping him, but a <laughs> lot of these questions. Um, what of, as you look back at the Trump phenomenon, what are the things that you maybe could have predicted but, but missed, were, were potentially predictable, and what are things that now it's just complete hindsight bias? <clears throat> People are saying, oh, I, I knew that could have happened, but it's, it's BS. So um, there were basically three types of arguments that we were making 
um, about why Trump was unlikely to be the nominee. Um, apart from some general, hey, in August it was early and anything could happen, which is meaningful in a race of 17 candidates, but there were three arguments that we thought were particular to Trump. Um, one of which is that uh, maybe Trump was kind of a media bubble where there were points in the campaign where he was getting 70 or 80 percent of network news coverage out of a field of 17 candidates. So um, there was some notion that when, um, when he got more coverage, his polls went up, it was a kind of a positive feedback loop. You know, I think that argument's an important part of the story. I think it's not sufficient, though, to explain it in the sense that polls now, real polls, exit polls, show people have been with Trump for a long time. So it's not like the support was fake. On the other hand, um, the fact that the other candidates received so little exposure is an important part of the story. So the kind of media bubble theory, I think, is somewhat wrong, but you can't talk about Trump without talking about the role that the media played and continues to play. Um, theory number two was that Trump was um, a factional candidate who would win some support, um, a la Pat Buchanan or Mike Huckabee or Ron Paul. And I don't mean to lump those candidates together, but they're all candidates who got 20 or 30 or something percent of the vote and had trouble progressing beyond that. Um, like that theory, I think, might actually be right. Um, Trump has not won a majority. We had, I think, 22 states and four territories vote, and we haven't had a Trump majority in any of them. He's averaged 35 percent of the vote. So it's on the large sides of a factional candidacy. I think it's actually he has multiple factions voting for him. Um, but the idea that a lot of Republicans dislike him not just a lot of independents and Democrats dislike him, I think has been under-recognized. And I, know, I was going to joke on Twitter this morning that all of this can be solved if we just had instant runoff voting, right? Which is where if you have your, um, if you're going to have a winner-take-all state, like Florida, for example, then um, your third choice is eliminated, then you get a chance to re-vote, in essence, between the top two mm -hmm. choices. There are lots of polls, even in Michigan, which Trump won by 10 points, 12 points, um, the exit poll said, asked voters one-on-one, -on -one, would you pick Cruz or Trump? And the plurality said Cruz. Some people said they'd sit out. And so that part's underappreciated. However, it might not suffice to prevent him from winning the nomination. If you had told me, um, if you had told me in August that Trump will only be getting 35% of the vote, I'd say it's a little higher than I thought, but you know, I'm still pretty confident he won't win. I assume that someone else has the 65% by the time you get mm -hmm. after the calendar. And that hasn't happened. Um, the third part was that, oh, the Republican Party would stop him somehow. There's kind of a famous book in political science called The Party Decides. It says usually party elites get what they want. Um, and that part, I think, is, is mostly wrong, not because the party didn't try, but because there's no like magic fire alarm they can pull <laughs> to stop him, and because they were disorganized throughout um, the early part of the process. So I think actually people who made the best predictions about Trump were the political scientist Norman Ornstein, who has written, for example, about the dysfunction within the Republican Party. Um, you know, an early sign we wrote about a little bit, but should have given more attention to, the fact that you had 17 candidates running, that was an early sign of, of dysfunction within the party. You're not supposed to have 17 candidates running who overlap with one another so much. Um, you know, people talk about endorsements. That's one indicator that's supposed to be predictive. Well, there weren't very many endorsements. People were not getting off the sidelines in the GOP until, until very late in the game. Um, and you wait until the last minute and brinksmanship, sometimes it still winds up being okay, but, um, but sometimes it's too late. So there are, I think, a lot of complicated lessons in the rise of Trump. But in some ways, it's that, um, you know, you can kind of be, I don't know. Um, you know, basically, we said a lot of things have to come together for this unlikely event to happen. And I think to some extent, a lot of things have come together. So I don't know. I mean, obviously, there are a lot of lessons you learn with the benefit of hindsight. I'm not so sure that the thinking behind it and the process behind it was really, was really all that bad. Mm -hmm. um, was the endorsement the party decides to? Is that something you subscribe to more and now less? Or is it something that you always were I think a little, of? I mean, ironically, in 2011, we wrote 
a kind of a critique of the prior decides. It said, oh, this stuff, it's a small sample size. It's not really that predictive. But the thing I think people miss is that the reasons at least I was skeptical of Trump were not just because of the party decide stuff. It was not like, you know, if the only thing stopping Trump from being nominated were the fact that um, a bunch of Republican poobahs were against him, then, you know, I think that would be not very predictive. But he also goes against um, what conservatives have voted for for, um, for the past 40 years. Um, you know, that's pretty significant that he's denounced a lot of the GOP platform. And I didn't see that coming, certainly. And also right. the fact that, you know, usually voters care about electability and winning elections. He is going into the general election, if he wins, against Hillary, as the most unpopular candidate ever polled in the history of the NBC Wall Street Journal survey. Um, you know, usually parties don't voluntarily, and you can debate how predictive those polls are, but parties don't usually voluntarily walk into a situation like that. So it's not just that he violates some academic theory, it's that he violates precedent in so many ways. There might be a lesson that if a candidate um, breaks so many rules and that candidate has like high variance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you could have said that I think Trump is quite likely to fail. However, there's a very wide confidence interval and therefore, um, therefore he's different than a Carly Fiorina or mm -hmm. something, mm. right? Maybe his average outcome is 2% of the vote, although it's, you have nonlinearities here, um, but there's some if chance that If it was the NBA draft, we would pick Trump. Very wide variance. We, we in like the those. NBA draft, Trump would be your, yeah, a great go very high <laughs> draft <laughs> pick at a central Arkansas state. Okay. <laughs> um, is someone making political predictions and reporting that's impressing you? Like, is there, is there someone out there that you're... You're saying, hey, I, I can't wait to read what he or she is writing. I mean, I mentioned Norman Arnstein mm -hmm. earlier. Um, you know, I know I'm kind of a cynic of a lot of press coverage. I mean, I do think... Um, aren't, you, aren't you the press coverage now, though? We're still pretty rambunctious <laughs> and provocative. I think the Washington <laughs> Post does a good job. Um, I've been impressed by the Washington Post coverage this year. Um, you know, their ratio of heavy lifting in terms of doing real reporting um, and real sourcing. You know, my problem with most coverage is that they're so quick to grasp for, for a narrative, right? And so quick to do the what it all means piece, um, which number one, often they get that kind of demonstrably wrong, but number two, there's so much going on that just kind of tell us what's going on first. I mean, mm. there's kind of the volume of political news happening is, is remarkable, but I, know, I mentioned, you know, I know. The Post has been, I think, had the best year of any major political outlet. <clears throat> There's been, I guess, I'm not as familiar with this, you would know better. There's been many voter suppression laws and tactics that have been passed in certain states. Do you see them affecting this election in any major way? So, you know, I would be in favor of a constitutional amendment uh, defending the right to vote. Um, that seems like a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that's normative. Empirically, there's not a lot of evidence that voter suppression laws make that much difference necessarily. Um, you know, in part because people are motivated by and specifically them. for the audience, we're talking about like you need a driver's license when you show up, or you need some uh, onerous form of yeah. ID to. So know. they can, you know, but those fortunately can encourage people to check their registration status and can actually encourage participation sometimes. Um, if people become complacent about that, it might be a different thing. But, but there are a lot of things that people don't think about. Um, voter registration is a form of voter suppression. Um, you know, why should, it, why should you have to register to vote one month ahead of time through a process that can be kind of cumbersome in some ways? Having to stand in line for three hours in Cuyahoga County in Ohio is a form of, of voter suppression. So, um, you know, if you had more guarantees that those things wouldn't happen, um, you know, by the way, having a caucus instead of a primary is a big form of voter suppression. If you're a shift worker in Nevada at a casino and the Democratic caucus between, you know, 1 and 2 p.m., whenever it was, like 11 a.m. actually, um, and you're on work, at work, you can't vote 
Um, so I think people worry a little bit too much about these ID laws, which again, I have problems with, but I think empirically don't make that much difference, and not enough about, about much bigger things. You know, felon voting, if you think that constitutionally we should have a right to vote, then even felons should probably have the right to vote. There are a lot of people disenfranchised by that. So I think people sometimes miss the, um, the bigger fruit for some of the low-hanging stuff. The brokered <coughs> convention stuff is in the news. Uh, quick explanation of what it is and will it happen? And do you think it will happen? Just brokered conventions. Um, <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah, riff on brokered. So yeah. <laughs> technically people would say contested conventions because there aren't brokers per se. But so um, one definition, the kind of betting market definition of a brokered convention is do you need more than one ballot to nominate a candidate? Um, and that technical part matters. So there's a fairly good chance that Donald Trump will not get, I think it's 1237 or something, 1200 plus delegates, that he will not get that many by California, which is the last state to vote in June, last set of states, California, New Jersey, um, but that he would get it between then and the convention. Um, because the thing is, if you go to the convention, and no candidate gets a majority on the first ballot, then most delegates are released from their obligation to vote for the winner of the state. Um, and by the way, most of these delegates probably are not huge Trump fans. They're chosen through these kind of very obscure party conventions. They're gonna be people who like the GOP and probably um, are more Mitt Romney Republicans than Donald Trump Republicans. So. Um, you know, there's also like not any recent precedent for what happens when you have a contested convention in an era where you had people voting in all these states. Um, so it's a really fine line between order and, and chaos. I mean, if you have a contested convention, you're gonna have every single thing litigated. Um, there was one delegate in New Hampshire that, depending on which rounding formula you lose, use, would either go to Romney, excuse me, to Rubio or to Trump. You know, that'll be, those, be some credentials challenge. Um, you know, in Nevada, you had a very chaotic caucus. Trump, I think, fairly clearly won. Um, but Cruz or someone will have a debate about what really happened in Nevada. Should we seat this delegation or not? Um, you know, the Guam delegation, it, it would be <laughs> totally nuts. And there'll be litigation, you think, after the convention? Litigation after, and I mean, especially Trump is a pretty litigious guy. Um, or so he says. But yeah, a, con a contested convention would be a, a interesting and maybe slightly dangerous situation. Yeah, will the Supreme Court have to step in again? Like, that was the, the actual election, but. Um, what is the, so what is the best place to look before deciding how to vote strategically? I really want to make sure Trump doesn't win in my state. <laughs> Where can I find which candidate has the best chance of beating him before I vote? Um, you know, so Michigan aside, the <laughs> polls actually have been pretty reliable for the most part this cycle. So you can go to 538 or Real Clear Politics. Oh, that's a good site. Or Pulse, yeah, a good yeah, site, yeah. That's good, yeah. <laughs> Look at a polling average. I mean, it seems like um, it's not that complicated for the states voting on March 15th on Tuesday. Um, how many people do you think do this, like just try to vote strategically versus? So, uh, some. I mean, people, not that many people vote in the primary. People kind of miss this, except in New Hampshire where you have like general election levels of turnout. It's pretty rare to vote. And so um, the voters who do vote are, are highly informed. That's kind of why you can have a debate or something shift the numbers by, by five points in a day sometimes. Um, but you know, if you want to uh, pick the second place candidate, then you pick Kasich in Ohio, Florida, you pick Rubio and Cruz everywhere else, I think. Um, last political question, we'll switch to sports. Um, what, what is your updated prediction for what's gonna happen? Ask Nate. <laughs> we, uh, you know, look, I think... Which, who'll be the nominees? I, I think you know the quote. Who'll be the nominees? Will a third party enter? Clinton is still very likely to be the Democratic nominee. 
What does um, that mean? Like how much? Like how likely? Prediction markets put her at at ninety five percent, and I think it's probably about right. I might take Bernie at twenty to one. Um, you know, for as much as the results in Michigan were an upset relative to the polls, um, we also have demographic projections or the targets really, right? They're a projection conditional on the race being 50-50 nationally. And they say that if the vote were 50-50 nationally, Sanders should have won Michigan by four points. Um, and he won by two points, same difference. But so basically, as big as an upset as that was, that was only good enough for him to tie his target when he's fallen below his target in 18 out of 20 states so far. So he now has to catch up and then somehow persuade superdelegates who are overwhelmingly pro-Clinton um, to switch their vote instead, which they could. Those votes are not locked in until the convention. Um, but you know, winning Michigan or tying Michigan, in essence, is what he would have to do in a competitive race, not just once in a blue moon, but he has to do the same thing in Ohio um, and Illinois. All those states should be real competitive. Missouri, you know, North Carolina is in the South, a little bit more difficult, but he should keep that within um, single digits, whereas it's 30 points for Clinton in the polls. So, you know, that race, I think, is still fairly predictable. On the GOP side, um, there are still reasons to be skeptical of Trump, the reason I mentioned before, where um, there are are about 35% of people voted for him so far, and he seems to not pick up that many votes as the field consolidates. The problem is that, like, who else is going to do it, really? Cruz has a shot. If Cruz won, say, um, Missouri and or Illinois, and then other candidates dropped out, I mean, Cruz is not that far behind Trump. He's won 28, 29% of the vote to Trump's 35%. Um, but apart from Cruz and Trump, it seems extremely fanciful to expect uh, I mean, Kasich hasn't won a state. For some reason, the narrative has switched to, oh, Kasich has a shot. We've had half the states vote. He has won zero states. He almost won Vermont. Um, <laughs> you know, there's not really a plan for Kasich. Uh, Rubio, I think, is in nearly as dire straits. It looks like he won't win Florida anyway. Um, you know, I suppose you could have Romney at a contested convention or something. But that, to me, seems fanciful. At the same time, Again, if you get to Cleveland and no one has a delegate majority, then there's a potential for, for chaos, kind of in multiple senses of that term, um, where there's no rule book really all of a sudden, and you have individual people making a decision um, who might not be Trump fans, and, and I don't know. Um, you know. Again, you go to prediction markets, they have Trump with the 60, 7% chance and Cruz at 15% and the rest at whatever else that adds up to, right? You know, I think Cruz is a little underpriced there. Um, I'm not sure that two out of three is, I mean, that seems like roughly, roughly sensible for, for Trump. And how would the general election go in that? Uh, someone thinks, is asking, is it the biggest trouncing in history of Clinton? That was the question. People forget that there have been elections before where candidate won by 25 points. Um, so 1924, the Democratic Convention went to 103 ballots, was controlled by the KKK, uh, and the Democratic nominee lost by 25 points. So, you know, this will probably not be the worst Republican convention no matter what happens. But, but I don't know. Um, you know, on the one hand, there's this kind of line of thought that Trump has defied so many predictions so far that you better not count him out in the general election. And that kind of makes some sense. I think it's a little oversimplified. On the other hand, um, he is incredibly unpopular with, with the vast majority of Americans. Um, <laughs> he is. I mean, like, and I feel like a broken record saying this, but he does not have a silent majority, he has like a noisy minority. <laughs> so far, he has a noisy minority of one party. He hasn't won the majority in any Republican state so far. Um, doesn't mean he can't be the nominee. Again, you know, you can have a factional candidate win, and that has happened. McGovern won in 72 with only 
of the Democratic vote in primaries and caucuses. Carter in 76 had 40%. So I guess there are some precedents for it, but still, um, usually when a party has that much trouble picking a nominee, then it's a bad sign for the party. I don't know. I mean, I'd say there's a, um, a 30% chance that <clears throat> Trump wins. You could have an indictment. You could have a recession. You could have a terrorist attack. You could have a new paradigm. Um, a 40 new paradigm? What do you mean? <laughs> what if he's really a black swan, right? What if you kind of have this contagious, I don't know. Oh, even one you can't think of. Look, there's some notion of if he's defied predictions, then be, be careful, right? Um, right? But you could have a 40% chance of a landslide, which is, I think, um, you know, I define it as worse than, I think that 2008 election where Obama went by seven points is on the fringe of a landslide and, and not. So you could have that or worse. Right now, he's eight points behind Clinton in polls. And I guess that leaves 30% for somewhere in between. You'd have to think, too, about the chance of a third party candidate running. Um, you know, it seems to me that there is some chance, I don't know how high I'd put it, um, some chance that you'd have some break off conservative third party ticket. Um, if that happens, that might reduce chances, Trump's chances from 30% to, to 10%. Um, but, you know, factoring that in is also important. I'm going to switch the sport. My summary there is up your error estimates on everything based on that. Yeah. <laughs> so you have wider error bars on every, every article. I you have wider, but that goes both ways. And I think, you know, people who say, oh, the Republicans guaranteed to get um, 45, 46% of the vote, like that's not true also necessarily. So, so with the NCAA tournament coming up, uh, you guys have a NCAA tournament model. I think has had some success. Any, any, what are the adjustments this year? And um, can, can, they, can you help them with their wagering and brackets? <laughs> so the big thing we're doing this year is we're going to have actually um, predictions made in real time. So you oh, can during see the game. during the game uh -huh. and how that affects the rest of the, the bracket the rest of the way through. Um, otherwise, it's pretty minor tweaking. Like we have an adjustment for injuries. Um, so before, and assume there was a generic, this is really nerdy. I guess it's the right room for it. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> so if a guy gets hurt, then who replaces him? Before, we assumed it was an NCAA Division I league average player. It turns out that that replacement level in college sports is variable. It's a slanted floor, where Duke's replacement level is way higher than Stony Brook's, for example. Unless, they get, really, unless they get really deep to the walk-ons. But even then, like, um, you know, a Duke walk-on is probably still an above average player relative to all of Division I. That's true. Um, I actually had a related question since you mentioned real time. Uh, do you think, you know, as part of the broadcast or watching online or whatever, having these real time probabilities enhance or decline from the viewing experience, i.e., Last night in our game, I think we were up eight. With, yeah. And if, if all Celtics fans there saw that we had a 98.5% chance to win, does, <laughs> does, the, does everyone leave? Is everyone like, or do they wait for the comeback? Is... I mean, I find the win probability stuff more useful in, for storytelling later on. Um, but if I'm out watching football at the bar or something, right, I want to know that it's 99% to one or something, I want to think there can be a story that develops still. But no, look, it's useful information. I think, you know, I don't particularly think that would um, enhance the viewing experience for people who want to watch the game. If you just want a summary of what's going on, because you're not watching the game, then that's very useful, right? If I want to know, should I tune into this game or not, or go take a walk and, or play with my kids or something, then maybe it's useful. <laughs> um, I think Jessica submitted this question. Will a 16 seed Ever defeat, ever defeat a one seed? Uh, does the fact that the tournament has, the, the teams have more parity help these odds? And I say Jessica submitted because her alma mater, Harvard, uh, was yeah. the only team to do it. So in the men's tournament, it hasn't happened, of course. And I think it's actually kind of um, a fluke that it hasn't happened, actually. Um, we've gone back and tried to kind of retrocast every NCAA tournament and um, and typically the 16 seeds would have somewhere between a 0.5% and a 5% chance, but about 
2% on average, and I forgot how many trials there have been, but you would have expected there to be some upset um, at one point in time. And parity is getting, um, you know, the one seeds aren't as dominant as they used to be. You're not UCLA in, in the 1960s anymore. Um, so we'll see, that. we'll see that sooner or later. Um, you improved your ELO ratings from the NBA this year. It sounds like you did an NCA now by adding individual player projections. Are there plans to use more granular player level projections in your other ELO ratings or other projections? Um, the NFL, it's tricky um, because you'd have to project every position differently and there's like no one projection system you can use. Um, I don't know. In baseball, I mean, you know, design Pakoda like, gosh, like uh, 13, 14 years ago now. Um, at some point, I might want to take a crack at developing another baseball projection system based on all the new data that we have. But the NBA is kind of a happy median for us in the sense that, you know, Carmelo or NBA system, there are actually very few um, publicly available NBA projection systems. And so it's not that complex a system. It's like a very simplified version of Pakoda. Um, you know, 10% of the number of lines of code is one way to think about it, as Pakoda had. Um, but it's done pretty well, actually. The Carmelo projections have beaten Vegas so far. Um, you know, that's always good to see Vegas as a high bar to clear ordinarily, and it's a lot of fun to interpret, but, um, but I don't know. We'd love to do, we, you know, to be honest, it's as likely that we double down in the NBA. We'd like to do a lot more with, um, with soccer, where I think is coming to that happy median too, where you have better and better data that's been a little bit underexploited maybe, and so that's another sport we're thinking a lot about. How would you think about the ideal number of teams in the NBA and other sports? Um, I wonder if it isn't too many, right? I mean, I know, I'm one of those typical hipsters. You're on the too many argument? Oh, okay, I'm interested. Well, um, I'm one of those hipsters who kind of likes the European relegation hmm. system, right? <laughs> like every sports nerd does, pretty much. Um, but no, I, I do wonder if you only have, maybe it's different in basketball. Relegation is when you, you're bad enough, you're like, you're kicked out, so. You don't get a Philly, for example, because... They're... Yeah, Philly would be relegated to the D-League. <laughs> oh. And the Erie Bayhawks or whatever would be in the, in the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I do wonder in the long term if you're only winning a championship once every 30 years um, and only in the championship game roughly once every 15 years. I do wonder if kind of building the story of your team, I wonder if that becomes harder at some point um, versus a league that's, that's 20 teams or something instead. Um, you know, I guess one other way you can say is that European soccer, it's, it's pretty darn market tested. Um, and worldwide, the number of teams we have in the major American sports now is on, is on the large side. Um, even in college sports, as conferences have grown, you're talking 10 to 16 teams. So I wonder if if league sizes aren't a little bit too big. Which doesn't mean I don't think that um, cities shouldn't have the right to have their franchise, but that's why I think having a, a tiered system or a relegation system is, is you know, in the long run, the way to go. Do you expect the, in most sports that the referees will be replaced by sensors, uh, you know, to detect out of bounds, you know, breaking the end zone plan, that that'll all, that'll all be automated? Um, Huh. I think it'll take a while and then happen very fast. Is my, like, kind of, I think once the seal is broken, um, then people realize, like, it's plainly irrational to have umpires call balls and strikes, right? It wouldn't work in every sport. I think you'd never probably have a computer calling penalties in, in hockey, or it'd be tricky. Um, but for things like, end zone detection, but balls and strikes in particular, like, all this evidence on on pitch framing, um, which is, of course, one of the most fascinating lines of research in sabermetrics in a long time. Um, that's where the catcher just sort of subtly yeah. makes a pitch that's out of the strike zone look like a strike. But that's really a big advertisement against how objective umpires are. Um, you know, if you saw the data on pitch framing, you're like, we have to immediately, if our commissioner of MLB would be like, 
wow, you know, based on the catcher manipulating the umpire, um, that can swing five or 10 wins a year sometimes in one direction or the other. Let's immediately go to automatically called balls and strikes. We had just on a side, we had a similar in NBA where certain players were attacking the basket in a certain way uh, such that, no, not James. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Such that they were, and and the the league has made several rule changes. Um, what about when are we going to see esports on five thirty eight? Why why has there not been coverage? We have some esports articles in the hopper. It kind of fits our demographic pretty well, for better or worse. So um, yeah, we're we're pro esports. Um, should performance enhancing drugs be allowed in sport? Uh, what? What will be the performance enhancing drugs for eSports? <laughs> Red Bull, I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know, I mean, I, I tend to resist the argument that, oh, because everyone cheats and therefore you should just make everything legal, I'm not sure I totally agree with that. Um, you know, I do think the things, how do you classify what's performance enhancing drug or not seems a little bit arbitrary to me. Um, I don't know. I mean, you could have two different leagues, um, a steroid league and a non-steroid league, and see how things go. I think that's what racing has done, right? They have sort of, yeah. you're allowed to do anything leagues, and the, you can only have this car leagues, right? So, um, Let's see. Will the... Will the <laughs> Will the corrupt bodies of the NCAA, FIFA, and IOC <laughs> ever affect their sports popularity? Um, I, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of the NCAA or FIFA. I'm not sure the IOC, they have problems, but it's a pretty low bar set by FIFA. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I have thought for a while that FIFA is vulnerable to a break-off coalition. Um, you know, the 15 or 16 largest revenue-producing soccer countries are responsible for 80% of the income that comes into FIFA or something like that, roughly. Um, so if you had Europe, basically, the United States and Brazil and or Argentina say, well, screw you guys, we're going to form our own soccer federation. Um, I'm not sure there's a lot that FIFA could do about that necessarily. Um, you know, the NCAA, uh, in some ways, is even more of a more of a cartel. The difference there is that the individual schools benefit from that cartel um, by not paying athletes who are producing a lot of revenue for the university. I mean, my whole joke is that if you really want to use the fiction of the student athlete in these huge revenue producing sports, then let's say that uh, football and basketball coaches should be limited to getting the median salary for a kinetics professor at their respective universities, right? Um, so I don't know. Uh, um, you know, maybe you could eventually have um, minor leagues that were organized that had some affiliation with the universities, but, but the NCAA cartel is, is harder to break, I think, and maybe the legal system will have to, I mean, I've spent a lot of time looking at this actually in about like, part of the problem too though is that it's not every student athlete who produces a lot of revenue for their school. It's, um, it's you know, the top 10% of men's basketball players, um, top 10% of men's football players, very elite women's basketball players, very elite baseball and hockey players, um, and it's probably about it, really. So that's the other thing, too, is people are like, well, these athletes should be paid. Well, for a lot of them, frankly, um, the scholarship is a pretty good deal, um, but the ones who are bringing in millions and millions of dollars to a Duke or a um, UT Austin or, or whatever else, or Michigan State, I'm a Michigan State fan, um, that's a big problem. You, you've obviously have been accomplished in forecasting both sports and politics. Which one uh, is, uh, where, which one is historical data the better guide for future performance? Oh, sports is 
much easier. And, and this election, I think, is a good um, illustration of why sports is like much easier to forecast. Um, we need to get 99 out of 100 states right in politics. So. Well, but we were only supposed to get like 93 of those right or something. So we've been running a little bit, a little bit hot. I mean, no, look, at some point, um, at some point, you can reduce politics down to a mechanistic problem. You can say that uh, here's the average error in the polls, and so we know that if the candidate leads by three points in the polls with 30 days to go, then we can just go back and say, what's the margin of error, and how often does that result in a win? Um, but something like the nomination process, like, you know, the irony is this Trump thing that we might be pretty wrong on, we never had a model for that. Um, it was just kind of me saying, here, I'm trying to assess the evidence as best I can and put a probability on it, but we never even tried to build a model for that. The kind of combination of structural complexity um, with a small sample size makes that very tricky. Maybe, you maybe we should have built a model. I think you had one question in the draft questions you sent me that you didn't ask, but like, it was, how do you avoid being biased? Oh yeah, I was about to get to that yeah. one. You know, one of the best ways to avoid being biased is that you have a model and you don't change the rules unless something is, is a bug, which can happen, by the way. Um, but, you know, if we build our general election model and we start out saying, well, Clinton's ahead in the polls or we have some prior um, saying Clinton's more likely to win, if Trump is ahead in the polls in October, it's going to have Trump favored. And we don't make any changes to that model. We kind of build a model, and you think carefully about model design, we'll probably launch it sometime in the, in the summer. Um, but from that point, it's just like a little robot that just kind of scrapes polls and you press go. You make sure you didn't type the polls in wrong, that can happen too. Um, but there isn't a lot of thinking required. So as much as I might like or dislike the forecast, then it's kind of, we agreed upon the rules of evidence ahead of time. If you get to a place where you're kind of able to change the rules in midstream, then it can be very hard to avoid, I think, hopeful interpretations or biased interpretations right. or, or over, I mean, they're like, you know, there are like 12 different forms of bias that are pertinent in, in political journalism, um, only one of which is kind of classic, I'm a liberal, therefore I root for liberals, or I'm a conservative, so I root for conservatives. But, um, but the more that you actually have focus on process, I think, and have rules of evidence in the form of of a model, um, that things are structured instead of free form, that's helpful. On the other hand, for something as complex as the nomination process, not one state, one state, you can be pretty mechanistic, but the whole process, it's a very challenging problem. Yeah, and I was, on that bias question, I was going to add, they, I think they were getting at sort of how in your, as you form 538, uh, how do you try to control for that, i.e., you know, universities might lean all one direction politically and, you know, an investment bank might lean another way. Like, do you try to control for that? I mean, for one thing, I think our, our incentives are well aligned in the sense that we get a lot of credit when we're wrong. We get a lot of, we get a lot of credit when we're right and a lot of shit when we're wrong. Probably too much to either extreme. I mean, we think you should be more process driven, but, but for better or worse, we have, I think, pretty strong incentives in terms of our credibility and the long run our economics and so forth, um, you know, but again, having a model is, is really helpful. It also doesn't mean, by the way, that as a citizen, you don't form judgments. I mean, the whole notion that like, um, you know, oh, journalists shouldn't vote, I've been toying with that idea a lot. I didn't vote in, um, in 2010 or 2012, 2014. I might, I might vote this year. But you didn't personally vote. I didn't vote. No, I'm not even registered, actually. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to register. Go vote. Is that because you know the math and it doesn't matter if you vote? So part of it, like I'm really busy on, I don't want to say that. I'm busy on election <laughs> days. Um, and I've lived in Illinois and New York, which are two states where the general election your vote doesn't matter. Although, ironically, if you are someone who lives in, um, in a city like New York City, um, your vote, if you were to vote in the Republican primary, is actually an extremely high leverage vote because for some reason Republicans give as many delegates to uh, my congressional district in New York, which is 85% percent 
Democrat in Manhattan versus one upstate that's 60% Republican, um, where there'll be five times the turnout in Rochester or whatever. So therefore, if you uh, are in New York or California or a state that hasn't voted yet, um, or Illinois, um, in a city in particular, then, uh, then your vote is a high leverage vote. So if you're being strategic, then this would be the time to, to decide to vote. I grew up in Ohio, I feel cheated. I never got to vote. I left when I was 18, so. Um, the, what sport do you find the hardest to predict? Um, I mean, I'm not sure that hockey is really that different than random. <laughs> I mean, not structurally. I mean, obviously, you go back to the old Red Wings teams, the Canadians teams, or whatever else, right? Um, but when you have the combination of a very rigid salary cap, um, plus it's kind of a hard, predictive, hard sport to predict, the analytics are helpful, but not that helpful. Um, you know, unless you have a team like Edmonton or Buffalo last year that's explicitly tanking, it's not that different than assuming each team has 502 talent and that you randomize things. It would not look that different than the actual NHL standings. You know, maybe the Caps, right, um, and a couple other teams, but it's, um, it's almost gotten to that point in the NHL where you can't do a lot better than that. How have your methods of modeling changed over the years? Lots of new techniques and approaches, both in politics and sports. Um, I think kind of coming to realize more that, uh, that models are tools, um, which sometimes means that you can actually have multiple tools for the job. So in the primaries, for example, we have what's called our polls only model, which is a short or simple model that just says, look at the polls, figure out how far off they might be. There's what we call polls plus, it's like a little bit fancier. There's our demographic projections, and they don't all agree, whereas the polling-based models would have said, no way, Bernie would win Michigan. The demographic ones would say, oh, sure, entirely, he could win Michigan. Um, and I think to kind of publish all those things, I think, is, is helpful. But to kind of be more explicit about your assumptions, you know, having models where, um, where you take the assumptions to be uncertain is another big thing I'm doing, right? So we have uh, uh, an NCAA football model where we try and kind of predict what the human judges will do, which is interesting. Um, but it takes those parameters as open. So how much carryover, for example, is there from week to week in the standings? Um, it says, well, it might be little or, it might, or, or there might be a lot, for example. So it's, these are highly technical types of things, but um, but kind of the uncertainty in assumptions, accounting for that in the way you go about doing forecasts instead of picking one assumption and pretending that you've made no assumptions. What are the, <clears throat> what are the worst predictions you see out there for say the NCAA tournament? I mean, I think bad predictions tend to be, um, tend to be overconfident. Sometimes you have models that are overfit, which means you do a lot of, um, of back testing on noisy data sets. Um, so I don't know. I don't, I've thrown enough shade today. I don't feel like calling anyone out in particular. <laughs> we'll have the, I'm well, judging the research paper talk... competition in, in 20 minutes, right? So maybe <laughs> we'll see then. But... They specifically ask about similar seeding predictions. Yeah, like the, the notion that certain seeds are unlucky, like... <clears throat> 12 seeds versus five seeds, it's mostly a, a myth, I think. Um, you know, it is true you kind of have an inflection point when you get toward, uh, toward the end of the at-large bids and the first automatic bids. So 12 seeds are sometimes quite a bit better than 14 seeds, for example, but that has to do with kind of the talent curve and where you are on that talent curve and not about the seed numbers per se. What's next, after the political election this year, what's next for 538? What's the, what's the big thing? Coming? I mean, um, we're doing a lot more science coverage. Um, we just hired another science reporter um, who's full time. So we have a three person science team now. Um, we write about stories about methodology in science. So, you know, p-hacking and things like that. But, um, but it's a very natural fit, science, health, technology for, for our audience. 
Maybe um, describe p-hacking, because I think it's a hot thing that's important. P-hacking, yeah. I mean, and you see this in modeling all the time, in, including in sports, um, but where people, where you have a lot of different approaches you could apply toward a problem. Maybe you are trying to choose between 100 different variables, and you keep trying different combinations until one of them produces a p-value that is statistically significant. Um, Meaning usually 95%. Yeah. And, uh, not coincidentally, there are a lot of uh, p-values in papers that are uh, are just at 0.05 or below, right? And very few at 0.051. So there's definite p-hacking. Um, but yeah, I think you know. Actually, I think one good thing is there has been more awareness in recent years um, of the fact that statistical significance is actually a very problematic concept, um, both in theory and in practice. So that's why. You know, you kind of asked before, what's your big philosophical change? It's again, to say, let's not put all our eggs in one basket, but to use multiple approaches and look for kind of a reasonable consensus of the evidence. Some fun questions I'm getting here. What are, what are the odds Tiger Woods wins another major? Ooh. Um, <laughs> it should be a game show, by the way, right? Like an estimation game show. Yeah. That'd be really unpopular. As long as they track <laughs> <laughs> Um, I won dinner from a friend. We had a bet. There would be about 4,000 people who watched it, I think. So. We had a bet over like the <laughs> GDP of Moldova, and I won. Anyway, yeah. um, Tiger Woods, 20%. You heard it here first. Um, the, yeah, the super forecasting folks are doing a lot of that, like a constant prediction revision. Have you seen, seen some of that? Um, no, the constant revision. That's like, my thing, question. I just tweeted to myself. One thing I think about is, what if I had had my subjective Trump odds where I just had the responsibility of publishing them every day? Like, that disciplining mechanism, I think, can be, can be helpful, too. A model is better. Setting the rules up in advance for, for time series modeling is better. But failing that, just making forecasts often is a good thing. What's the most frustrating question you get over and over? Um, I mean, you know, a question I used to get a lot, I don't know if it's frustrating, it's just a question that I always got a lot, was do you think that um, your forecast can affect the results? Which is an interesting question, you know. Um, I do think in campaigns that, in primary campaigns, that polls can affect the results. There's like a lot of evidence that they affect media coverage, obviously, a lot of people kind of jumping on, on the bandwagon. So you can have various self-fulfilling or self-canceling prophecies. I think one reason why Bernie might have won in Michigan was because polls showed Clinton far enough ahead that her voters maybe felt like they didn't have to turn out. Or in Michigan, you can vote in either primary. They might have said, I'm going to vote for um, Trump to troll the Republican Party or Kasich to stop Trump instead. Um, and so I think that those things are worth thinking about. Well, with that, we'll turn it on. I think it's safe Trump won't win, based on what we've heard. Oh, no, look, I... I <laughs> <laughs> um, although there has been a funny thing in the GOP side where kind of every time people felt like Trump was on the verge of wrapping things up, he had a setback, and every time they thought, oh, Trump's really in trouble, like the primaries we had on Tuesday, he does pretty well. So if that pattern continues, maybe he'll, I don't know, to me, it's like the principle of maximum annoyance, right? <laughs> Where we, at every single turn, in, since people started voting, had this ambiguous result where we keep arguing over, is Trump inevitable or not? So maybe he'll like win Ohio and Florida, but unexpectedly lose North Carolina and Illinois or something. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Can he tack middle? I think I've seen. Um, I think you'll have a lot of centrist pundits who will forget about all the stuff he's done recently, which I think some of which is pretty horrible, and say, look at how he's pivoted, but I don't know. I mean, one difference is that you're going to have a Democratic nominee, Clinton probably, or Sanders, who is very good at the basic blocking and tackling stuff. When Trump says something outrageous during the general election, Hillary will be raising $5 million dollars off that. Um, Hillary will be, she's, you know, pretty competent at debates. Clinton will have a very good 
field operation that will be motivated in part by, by stopping Trump. So I don't know. I mean, it'll be um, somewhere between the, I think, the 1964 LBJ kind of campaign, where they're like, Trump is an existential threat to the country. And if you guys have ever seen literature from the Edwin Edwards, David Duke gubernatorial campaign in 1991 in Louisiana, where Edwards had a sticker saying, vote for the crook, it's important. <laughs> um, so somewhere between those two polls might be how Clinton would run against Trump, I think, potentially. I Thanks wanna, very much. Yeah, sorry to jump in. Uh, if you guys don't know, this was our first face, Facebook Live broadcast. We had uh, over 53,000 people tune in. Wow. So thank you guys very much. Cool, thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks a lot.